of logical innovation. Today is a busy day for us. Uh, we just came back from Milan. Professor Akasofu um, was a founding member of the, uh, the Institute in Alaska, was the International Arctic Research Center. International Arctic Research Center. He's, uh, he was at the University of, of Alaska until 2007. He worked with Sidney Chapman, who is a very famous uh, scientist and is won the Chapman Medal, amongst many others on his resume that was on the pages, and I, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember all of it, but he's, a, he's very distinguished and has come to visit us here. Uh, he's been to Maui only three times. Uh, the, the time, um, the earliest time was back in the 60s, when, when actually Alec was very, very different, and it was a joy to go up to the summer see how things are changing even now with the ATSP. It's quite incredible. Um, his talk today, because he has been in, involved in um, many aspects of understanding the magnetosphere of the Earth and the aurora, it's actually much more than a hobby. Uh, and, and what he's going to talk about today is the, the Sun-Earth connection and Something about, we can talk about the climate also. Oh, if you have time, but uh, try. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Very, very nice to see you all, and uh, I have to talk about various things. First one, I will talk about the sunspot, the solar flares, are those are very much important for us to study the aurora. And uh, my uh, specialty is the aurora environment. The title, forget it, it's not a title. And uh, we have uh, two institutes. Uh, one is the Ge Geophysical Institute. And this is International Arctic Research Center. Okay, so uh, just to show you uh, our environment, and we see the aurora all the time. Uh, the solar physics is now my field, so uh, what I'm going to say I look at the sun quite differently uh, from, uh, you know, solar physicist's point of view. So please bear in mind, I may be completely off. Of course, uh, this is Bob Cook's uh, famous uh, sunspot model. The sun has a differential motion, a wind-up magnetic energy, uh, from time to time, uh, this magnetic flux pops up and uh, produces a pair of sunspot. Uh, this is what I learned, but, uh, so this, then, of course, this magnetic flux still pops up, and the cross-section of the photosphere is the sunspot I learned, we learned, and then various complicated things happen, uh, solar flares. Somewhat different way, this is solar magnetogram, very early days magnetogram, and you can see <coughs> a positive region, negative region. This is, uh, I, I believe it's called unipolar region, UM region. And, uh, Blue place uh, negative sunspot. And I thought it's very strange if uh, 
this is correct, uh, this can happen any place. Uh, this red spots are always in this red area. And uh, then I found that those are what we call uh, uni the isolated spots. And uh, those pair are called uh, sunspot pair. And uh, so, for example, this one, isolated spot. So uh, I came to the conclusion that, uh, uh, let me state conclusion first, unipolar regions are more fundamental than sunspot. Sunspot is just a local perturbation in the UM region. That I perhaps quite different from uh, sort of physics change. If a uh, sunspot is the way that they form in the way we learned, there should not be single or isolated spot. The sh sunspots should always appear as a pair. But uh, there are a whole bunch of uh, single spots. We cannot explain. So uh, this is why uh, I look at, let's look at one more time. Um, the positive spots are always in positive area. Negative spots are always in negative area. Uh, so Babcock's model, if that's correct, uh, should not happen. The sunspots the case. So uh, I thought that in the polar region, maybe the positive spots appear on the positive in the polar region. And negative spots always appear in the negative uh, UN region. And the further more important thing is that sunspot pair is always at the boundary of a positive unipolar region, negative unipolar region. All these sunspot pairs, uh, this is a little complicated, and uh, you can see this one, boundary. So uh, I thought that the single spots somehow must form in po positive, the single spots form in the positive unipolar region. And uh, for some reason, the uh, two together, uh, so there must be some coupling. And, uh, <coughs> okay, so, uh, is there any flow? There has to be something, you know. I look at only uh, the surface feature because below the photosphere, I on the surface feature. Then there seems to be something flow, the inward flow, and uh, then upper part, there's the upward flow. Uh, this is one case that the blue or positive upward flow and then uh, the downward flow outside. And this is up, I think this is called, uh, let's see, I forgot the name, uh, upward flow. And then also, somewhere below, there's a, sorry, a rotational flow as well. Let's go back. There is a some place, there is a, some depth inward flow, and the upper part definitely outward flow. So there must be some kind of a flow pattern around the sunspot. I mean, this is observation 
uh, how to put those things together is, is it difficult. It's, uh, of course, the rotational flow. Now, the sunspot pair tend to form at the boundary. And uh, this, uh, I'm not sure that the guy called uh, Mackintosh, uh, Jack Peek, did lots of studies, and uh, he was always at the boundary. Let's see. Is it the black screen button? On the Mac? On the remote. He got the remote. Let's um, put something. Yeah, it's okay. Hello. Um, Is it on the phone gun? Well, I guess so, because it's on the screen. Okay. Hey, this is Anya. I lost the slides, but I can now see Jason in the IFA auditorium. Yeah, we, we lost the slides, too. Okay, let me go back. Um, so, somehow when Jason came on, the slides got replaced by the video feed. Jason, did you push a button you're not supposed to push? <laughs> Jason, you have to push the button. I cannot hear you, Jason. I see your mouth moving, but Jason, we don't hear you. I think you're not yeah, okay. Sorry. Sorry. I don't Sorry. think it was you. I, mm, I, I think see. it was something else. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, so I was just saying there, um, we never had the slides here, but I can mm -hmm. log in and log in again. I don't know. Okay, we, we need an expert, I think. Um, I think each of the polycom systems should connect to the same IP that we are all in 6001. I think what could have happened is that someone connected directly to an IP like we did in the old days, but this is not good. So be sure that you all connect to the proper IP of the video switch, which starts with, um, let me look it up. I come back when I have the number. It should be 128171 no, I, I disconnected it. I'm just going to recall. Welcome to Unified Conferencing. should be able to turn on the projection. Uh, somebody, we just, we we just the reconnected. Slides. There we go. Okay. What button did you press? I was just getting ready. Yeah, okay. Okay, we have the slides back here. Yeah, I mean, I know. We can afford the value. Yeah, we know what to do that. Okay, okay. so I... Can you see it? Problem. I can. I can show it. Um... Are you connecting to 6001? Yeah, so I can see it's being but I can't see the slides. I, I see the slides and I'm connected to 6001. We can, we can turn the camera so you can see them at a large angle if you like. All I see is a blue screen. On your Polycom, um, Jason, on your Polycom remote, you have a display file. Maybe it's just presenting the wrong feed to you. Try talking through the displays until you find something that works better. Yeah, I'm going to try that out. And we're re recording anyway. Could could you mute that in? Okay. It's kind of loud. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, <coughs> let me put this way. Uh, let me go back. We have uh, Bob Cook's model of uh, 
מאוד מוקדש. פשוט, ופופינג אפ פשוט, כאן לא בא אין לי פרייס פרום הסאן, והרבה זה עוד פרוגרם, אבל זה סינג ספורט. סאן ספורט זה מאוד אורוויז אקי אז אפייר. זה סינג ספורט, so we have a program there, number one. The number two is that there is a uni uh, magnetic polar region that is fairly weak field and uh, positive the spots always seem to form in the positive single spots always tend to form in negative UM region. So that does not agree with the Barcock's model. And then uh, McIntosh said a long time ago that sunspot pair always form at the boundary of the uniform, of the uh, unipolar region, positive and negative. So, uh, the, so I came to the conclusion that Uh, sunspots are not caused by uh, popping up of a, of a magnetic uh, flux tube from below. Must be something to do with uniform. How, what can make the sunspot, say, positive unipolar region? How can we make positive sunspot? So there has to be convergent flow. And the, uni the unipolar region field is weak, so there must be convergence. And uh, I try to find um, evidence of uh, the convergence. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are several papers that show this these days, uh, the convergence flow towards <coughs> the sunspot. Then upper part, The, the, there is an upward flow. I think it's called Evershade flow for a long time. So there is something cyclone, but uh, there must be something, the photospheric gas motion uh, that uh, disturbs many polar regions to make sunspot. So that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> Is any usually that uh, the if you form a single spot here in a positive unipolar region, if they are connected to the neg the negative unipolar region, it can induce the spot. If they are connected in the way, you can make, make a sunspot pair. So I'm trying to make sunspot on, on, the, on the photosphere, not popping up from below the photosphere. That's of course that not the way that most people think. But, but uh, on the other hand, you know, it's very clear that I showed you, I hope I'm right, that uh, the positive sunspot forms in positive UM region, negative sunspot form in negative UM region, and furthermore, sunspot there at the boundary. Somehow we have to explain, and uh, so I consider over uni unipolar region. I'll show you one more time. And uh, of course, when the resolution increases, it's rather difficult to see, but I can see. And also, uh, I found this in the Kids Peak Observatory. Uh, there are spots like this. Uh, that's kind of 
suggest some, some, I don't want to call this typhoon, but there's something atmospheric motion. And uh, so uh, the, there must be something in the photosphere, the photospheric gas motion will make a sunspot in the, in the photosphere. Uh, so I then, the formation of sunspots are very complicated, usually it takes uh, one week or so, uh, so you can see the, uh, the you know, growth of the sunspot all the way to the sunspot pair, and uh, but this is a single, you know, during a single rotation, uh, you can see uh, from almost nothing to uh, the sunspot pair. And actually this, this is the uh, positive unipolar region, this is negative. Uh, now there must be some kind of motion going on. Uh, then, of course, you have to explain the famous butterfly diagram. That's hard. Uh, I uh, try to find anything in the photosphere. But the, there is the shear flow starts from high latitude to a lower latitude uh, during the one spot cycle. So uh, shear flow is something that could produce eighty. So and, uh, this is the only thing I could find that it shows the eleven year cycle other than butterfly diagram. So maybe this kind of shear flow will uh, disturb the unipolar region. In fact, uh, again, this is a Macintosh. This, you can see the fresh shear flow, and then sunspot tend to form uh, like this along the uh, shear flow, the boundary. So uh, I am sure that some atmospheric motions are involved. Okay, now. Let me go to the solar field. Uh, so the one of the base uh, two ribbons or so double ribbon, two uh, strand of uh, HR for emissions, and th the idea is that somehow that uh, two sunspot pair comes cried and somehow produce x line and then somehow there will be uh, the double ribbon with flares. And I have a little different view of this. Uh, there is the electric current flow between the uh, Here's the upward flow, here's the upward flow. Upward flow is uh, mean, uh, so uh, can pr produce uh, solar flares. There are some models, as you know, and here is the uh, two ribbon, sorry. So what I, uh, we did is to uh, assume uh, this is magnetic arcade and then you put in the uh, anti-parallel flow uh, along the center line then compute the electric current flow and at the same time, we did the, the, the prominences, and you can see uh, 
very nicely the changes for prominences. But at the same time, we compute the current. So uh, uh, upward flow is produced by downward current and the electron flow. So uh, you could have a current like this. And uh, we, for normal conditions uh, of uh, magnetic arcing, uh, we compute the current and uh, then the, in the ion sphere, you know, the, for the aurora, the aurora is a curtain like, this is very thin current sheet. And if you have an electron current sheet coming down to the ion sphere, it always develop potential structure. That is to say, the electric potential structure like this, and that accelerates the electrons, and then from this potential structure, the you know hundred electron volt uh, electrons in the upper part of the ionosphere, uh, when this goes through this become 10 kilovolt. Uh, so uh, if you, have, you need uh, something, electron flux, 10 to the 14 electrons per square meter per second, just for comparison, uh, the flux is about 10 to 11, and that's enough to produce the aurora. The, Interesting thing is upper part of the chromosphere is very much like uh, the ions, upper part of the ionosphere. So perhaps we can treat them together except that uh, the aurora we have oxygen atoms, uh, the chromosphere the hydrogen, that's the difference. But uh, this the counter stream and then that is that is actually dynamo dynamo process that produces a current flow the along the arcade in this way and the uh, electron flux is that uh, that's enough to uh, that's enough to uh, the produce double given the flare. The energy wise, that's what we need. So, uh, however, it's the uh, this is double ribbon flare. Here is a magnetic or the spotless flare. So got to be produced by some some process, and so what I propose is uh, along the center line there is a counter flow of plasma uh, becomes a dynamo, then the electron electric current flow along the arcade uh, this way that way uh, where the electron is flowing into um, it's is upward the current region. Uh, the electrons uh, get accelerated uh, by potential structure and uh, they excite double ion flare. Um, this is not the way that I think solar physicists are thinking. It's the uh, sort of uh, physics, uh, the, what they call uh, x ray and then uh, magnetic reconnection occurs that provides all the energies. But uh, coronal density here is about that and uh, you have to provide the electron flux. It's pretty tough. Uh, this region of a uh, corona is not dense enough to provide the electrons to enough to produce the light. 
So uh, that's rather than this, uh, if you assume that the uh, here is the arcade, and the, if there is a counter flow, and the upward current region is produced by downward electrons. When the downward electrons come in uh, to the photosphere as a chromosphere, that's about the level of the ionosphere. And that in the magnetosphere, the above the ionosphere, there always the potential drop develops. And uh, I talked to many solar physicists uh, the, 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 this idea of a potential structure never been used in solar physics. But uh, we, did, we see this all the time, satellites see this. There are many ways uh, we know that exist. So uh, rather than proposing something else up here, and uh, the dynamo process here could make uh, at least a double ribbon phase. Of course, some very energetic particle could be formed by some process here. But uh, in order to produce free ribbons, all you need is about 10, 20 kilovolt electrons. So we don't need a very energetic process here. So that's the second point. So uh, this could be due to uh, the uh, plasma f uh, counter plasma flow here, and then, uh, then go to uh, uh, an another subject. The at the time of rays often this uh, filament wraps. I think French people call this a DD or something. Uh, there are many cases like this. The dark ribbons, which is just a hydrogen strand, and then move up and then it comes to ribbon flares. And then in this filament, uh, there's a magnetic field, a very twisted magnetic field. So that means the current flowing. And this is one example that studied in great detail. Here is the strand move up. Uh, the actually came to the earth. So there must be some process uh, filament uh, pushed upward by the lens force or something that uh, come all the way to the earth. And there are many simulations going on and uh, they call it the flux rope. And uh, maybe stereo uh, observation appear to see something. Uh, of course, there's many ways to interpret, but uh, something like uh, at, the, uh, on the earth, at the distance of the Earth, it's very complicated magnetic uh, flux tube. And uh, so we, in this particular case, uh, here is the dark, the black line is observation. And uh, we try to simulate this uh, with this model. And uh, particularly important part is this. We seem to uh, be able to reproduce that. But uh, the usual simulation is very, very hard. It's this, this phenomenon. And uh, this is a famous uh, a filament where I we calculated the electric current for this uh, helical structure. It's about 10 to 9 amperes. And around the sun, the, near the 
Sanskrit area, it's about uh, 10 to the 11. But, uh, so part of that could produce this when the uh, flat slope expands and uh, could reach the earth. By that time, it becomes about 10 to the 9 amperes. So, uh, <coughs> as at the time of this, somehow the magnetic flux tube was shot out, and uh, this is some people call CME, and contained very complex magnetic field, <coughs> but as the um, a model, they try to fit the observation, uh, it uh, looks like, like this, but uh, you use the two or three space probes and see uh, something like that seems to exist. Uh, this is another case. Uh, so, uh, some sort of fil filament eruption is involved in producing CME. Okay. Sorry, but I would, I'm sorry, this, uh, I'm not doing a good job here. <laughs> but, uh, some of people think that this is a magic, magic place and we have long been discussing uh, in the magnetotail sent up uh, many satellites in this region and try to see what's going on. And uh, all we can see is some flow from this region, plasma flow. And uh, but none of the plasma flow agree with theory or simulation. We do not know exactly what kind of flow this is. And uh, they are trying to see the relationship with the aurora, but uh, this flow is very short, only about a 15 seconds or 30 seconds, and uh, just doesn't have enough energy to produce the aurora. And uh, we do not see electron stream coming down to produce the aurora. My satellite has never seen elec electron stream. So that's another reason that I think that uh, this place cannot produce electron stream in the chromosphere to produce double legal pair. And some ideas, and maybe that's uh, part of my, my talk. So, so let me summarize quickly. The, as far as sunspots are concerned, instead of uh, the magnetic flux still popping up, uh, I suggest that the, un the unipolar region is more important than the sunspot. Uh, then positive sunspot forms in the positive sunspot region, the unipolar region, negative sunspot form in the negative UMP region, and the sunspot pair somehow form as a boundary. I think that uh, that much is uh, fairly certain. But, and the uh, second is solar flares, um, most people think that uh, somehow x line on the cusp of uh, the top of the cusp generate electron streams, but uh, uh, it, the some similar situation happened in the magnetosphere, and we expected that the x line produce electron streams but we never seen this. And none of the satellites observed this stream. So we got to do something. And uh, uh, so I propose that uh, 
rather this kind of an X-ray configuration. Here we have a uh, we have the uh, counter flow and the dynamo process, uh, whatever it is, but the uh, dynamo process, the dynamo generates a current, and the electric current involves the goes the electron flows, and the electron flows, and along the field line, always develop potential structure and can accelerate electrons. In fact, I see in so many papers in solar physics and x ray try to produce high energy electrons, but I'm not sure they're succeeding. But uh, we have uh, theory and also satellite, uh, see the query that people might take a look at, if that's a simpler way to generate about 10 kilovolt, 20 kilovolt electrons. Yeah. Okay, then is there any questions so far? Do you want to take questions at the end? Oh, uh, maybe at the end, yeah. Okay, so uh, I came here, so but. Uh, Was something something about the aurora. So I could say something but, uh, rather quickly. Uh, aurora is a very spectacular phenomenon. <laughs> And I'll show you a movie too, but uh, we actually the term Aurora is actually the uh, Roman goddess name, the goddess of dawn. Uh, how this name come into a scientific term, we have a lot of argument uh, <laughs> to try to find but uh, that, uh, I don't think we have a, a unified idea. But uh, the definitely the term orthology. Have you seen auroras in Greece? Sorry? Have you seen auroras in Greece? Have you mentioned that? Oh, yeah, it's ancient time after Arius. There are lots of uh, Greek philosophers described you know, the, those days, the, the stars, the holes in the sky, mm -hmm. and the uh, aurora, they say, the, the cracks in the mm -hmm. sky, and the, so they use the term chasm. The chasm is the uh, crack, so, mm -hmm. so they have, they must have a scene. Mm -hmm. yeah. So i show you just a few snapshots. I'll later show a movie. Um, most of the light uh, comes from uh, up to about 100 kilometers. Most abundant element is atomic oxygen, not molecular oxygen. Uh, molecular oxygen dissociate into uh, two atomic oxygen. So uh, when the electron hits the upper atmosphere, the emission comes from the emission is uh, 65 7 seven Armstrong. Now, like people call 55.77 nanometer, or something. And uh, basically, it's a curtain. Uh, the thickness is about 500 meters, but the extent is thousands and thousands of kilometers. And so, you know, right, that we bundle up and so on, so uh, some instability process we do not, but the uh, electron stream wind up like this. Uh, what that's what you see. Uh, we use a laser beam to study that. Okay, oh, sorry. And, uh, 
I told you this green is the atomic oxygen, and something we see this is pinkish color. This is about 90 kilometers. The green aurora is almost exactly 100 kilometers. But when the electrons, the energy, the electrons are higher than, they penetrate deeper and then hit nitrogen there. So when you come to the 90 kilometer level, there's lots of nitrogen uh, molecules. And uh, this emission is a combination of very various things, but uh, color is pink, it's very beautiful. Sometimes you see this kind of structure, it looks strange. And uh, uh, this, is, however, in the morning, this curtain breaks up into pieces. Uh, this we call patches. But And uh, you can see the aurora in, in downtown Fairbanks. And the curtain sometimes single, but uh, sometimes as many as ten. In this case, one, two, three, four, five, or six of them. Uh, this is. What we are seeing is this. Uh, first of all, uh, this greenish light is atomic oxygen. Uh, you are looking at upper part. In other words, magnetic field lines like this. And uh, we are looking at much higher height than this atomic oxygen has a two emissions. When it rather softly produce red light, uh, the wavelength is 6300. Uh, 6300 nanometers. And uh, what you're doing is to looking out. And uh, as you know, if you look at the distance, the radio, seems to converge, okay? and uh, <coughs> this is what we're looking at. It's everything seems to converge, but uh, you are looking at a very different height. This is about 500 kilometers, this is 100 kilometers, so you see it's 300 kilometers. So just like a radio, you know, the different names, the corona, but this is just the way you look. You have uh, at least, uh, oh sorry, uh, at least uh, one curtain here, here is another curtain, here is another curtain, another curtain. So in this case, four curtains, you are looking up, mm -hmm. then you see the convergence. Is that what you'd see by eye, or is it enhanced by the photograph? Okay, you can sometimes see this by naked eye, but that's maybe a few times in one split cycle. You have to very intense prayer. Uh, um, our eyes, the sensitivity shut off just before this, uh, 636200, zero, zero, something like that. Mm. So. Some people can see this red, but most people cannot see. But the films, and film can see that. Film has a little long-like extent. So, uh, so some people can, I can see this red, why it's in a film. The synthetical films are a little more sensitive to this. Just few, few more. When you see structures like that, is that interacting with something in the atmosphere? Like gravity waves or something? He's asking, is, is the structure caused by 
effects in the atmosphere like gravity waves or winds uh, or other things that no, uh, the elect the carbon you know, carbon is uh, actually electron sheet beam. When uh, if you stick in electron sheet beam into the atmosphere, then the electron excite all these um, the uh, oxygen atoms. That's what you see. So the basic structure is the electron thin electron sheet beam uh, coming into the atmosphere. But at the present time, we do not know how this electron sheet beam forms phenomenon. It's way up someplace the electron sheet beam is formed. Yeah. My question was, is there an interaction with the sheet beam with anything in the atmosphere that causes it? Let's see. So, yeah, if you get the next slide or the previous one. So, so I think he's asking is, is, do you learn anything about the atmosphere from this? Is the structure that you see caused by anything in the atmosphere, or is it simply the shape of the curtain as it oh, comes okay. into the atmosphere? Okay, of course, we, this way we learn the atmosphere composition. Uh, you know, the, we, we could look at very carefully how the luminosity, oxygen line, nitrogen line, all this will change as a function of height particles as a function of height. But uh, the, if there is any structure, what? I uh, don't think so. But the only thing is that uh, ox because oxygen atom exists above 100 kilometer level, so the, we see green bang only to about 100 kilometers. Then the electron energy gets more than half 10 kilovolts, then penetrate deeper up to 90 kilometers, then we see nitrogen. And if you go even higher, then we hydrogen, and helium, and hydrogen, way up. Yeah. That's what we can do. So we can see the structure of the composition at a very, you know, arc, uh, <coughs> This is called the corona, but uh, you can see the convergence. We are looking at the from bottom 100 kilometers to about five or 600 kilometers above. Okay. But it is, it's called the corona, but it's not different type or anything, just, just the way it looks, depending on where you are with respect to the oral curtain. Uh, because it's, you know, there's all kinds of mythology and the native people, and all of them, the es as far as the es Eskimo people are concerned, all the uh, stories uh, related to, uh, uh, <coughs> they say this is a bridge for the spirit to go up in the heaven, or well, no, this is the, uh, a torch which leads the dead spirit to uh, heaven. Uh, everything is related to uh, spirit. So, Eskimo people see this in this way. Uh, this is the, uh, once, in, once or twice in one spot cycle, this is red aurora. Color is just like this. The whole sky is reddish. And as I say, that this is the, uh, at about 500 kilometers away. Just like, uh, you know, if you see the telephone pole, in the distance it looks, it's getting shorter and shorter. Uh, but uh, when the gold miners came to Alaska first, they thought that is a vapor from the gold mine. Mm -hmm. So let's get there. <laughs> no. However you go, this is just perspective effect. So, uh, oh, 
سالی دیگه نه What's the gate all over you have a pinkish all over? It goes up, but from time to time go up much more, a thousand kilometers. Space shuttle goes through this, and all the meteor, meteor evaporates somewhere at this height. And so uh, the Well, jet plane fly, fly around 10, kilo, 10 kilometers, 40,000 feet, and the uh, bottom height of the aurora is way up, so aurora is nothing to do with the weather. Uh, this is the uh, image from Shuttle Space Shuttle, you see the Earth, and then here's the aurora, and the upper part is red. This is another space shuttle. And uh, <coughs> if you go further distance, about three years radio away, the, now you can see the whole thing. The aurora is a ring surrounding the magnetic pole. And this is what we call aurora oval. It's not circle. And uh, this is geographic North Pole, this is magnetic pole, so it's centered around the magnetic pole. And of course we see the uh, <coughs> northern one and the southern one, this is called Aurora Borealis, and then this one called uh, Hawaii is here. But then <coughs> we see, we expected that the planet which have a magnetic field should have the aurora. And uh, as so we waited for the uh, Hubble telescope, the so nice aurora. Oh, so on the other hand, Mars and uh, the Venus. We look at all the images, we never see the world. So, magnetic field is definitely involved, and uh, spectrum, and the, we have uh, various red ones, and the, this is atomic oxygen, 6300, the H alpha, H beta, and so on. And then atomic one, and then this is nitrogen group. And the so uh, solar corona, of course, solar corona becomes solar wind. And sorry, that this is in Japanese, but the plasma. A magnetosphere and the earth. So, solar wind produce, as you know, the comet like structure called the magnetosphere. And uh, the dynamo, of course, aurora is electrical, just picture phenomenon. So, we need the dynamo or generator. And uh, I don't see there is any. Uh, different opinion that Earth's magnetic field, the solar wind carries the solar magnetic field and uh, then is combined with Earth's magnetic field. And uh, when solar wind goes through this, this uh, V cross B, that's the electromotive force, and that is, so we have a generator on the surface of this magnetosphere. Uh, then how, why the aurora comes is, is a very different thing. 
we have a big discussion corner, no one agrees anything, so that's where we are. But basically what we are doing, see, is that uh, it's very much like oscilloscope. Uh, the oscilloscope, we have an image on the screen, and the electron beam hits the back of the screen, fluorescent material produce light. In the same way, the electron beam hits the upper atmosphere and it produces the light. That's what we see. So all over the image you see. One of our big subjects is power supply. I think I told you that. But we know that much at least that the solar wind blowing comet shape, the cavity, uh, producing power. And electromagnetic, the, of course, earth magnetic fields, but other electromagnetic fields, uh, something corresponding to the electric plate, uh, the, the, uh, the equals all kinds of motion of the aurora, just like an uh, image produces uh, all kinds of uh, heartbeats and so on. So we are uh, trying to find out what's going on, particularly in the magnetosphere, try to measure those things. Let's see. Yeah, I just, I'm sure you saw this. So, uh, And solar fluid, the CME, what you call CME, uh, advances and produce a shock wave in front of it. So CME is somewhere here, the helical structure we cannot simulate, it's uh, too hard. But at least uh, we can see past the Earth and go beyond the Mars. We can see it goes all the way to uh, Jupiter and beyond. Uh, the, this uh, ring of uh, aurora, or, or what we call oval, uh, contract and expand depending on solar activity. And when we have a big sort of air, then uh, this orbital expands. And you can see that here's the Kamchatka, Alaska, even went south of Seattle and uh, south of Chicago and New York. So this thing, oh can expand. So you can see it in law of and try to find out what kind of electric field, what kind of magnetic field changes, and how we can explain all these various aspects of, of the aurora. Uh, here's, you know, one thing people doing daily great optics. So what I would, this is what I like to ask you. Do you know why we have this 55.77? Because of the oxygen. Why do we have oxygen? We have life. We have a plant. Life, this is hydrogen energy. And uh, because why oxygen? Because of uh, plants. <coughs> now uh, astrophysics astronomers find I have some more now more than 200 the uh, star with uh, stars with planets, and around 50 of them are comparable to the Earth. And then, 
simplest way, uh, simply, not simple, but one way to uh, find life if it exists or not, also like life, is to, uh, if you could very high probability that life exists, plants exist there. If uh, dinosaurs or humans, we do not know. So, I propose one way to detect life on other planets is to uh, find oxygen emission. And uh, observatory on top of it, mountain perhaps. It's not easy because you have all kinds of background right? But if you could detect the high the oxygen emission, because oxygen is you know, very active, so they combine uh, with all the other material. Oxygen it cannot exist in the atmosphere. So uh, that's one thing I'd like to you know, the people are so good and spectral scopies. Okay, let's stop here first. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you talked about many different things. Yes. Um, uh, let's see if we can... If we have the time, I will talk about global uh, warming, but let's not worry about it. See. That might be the thing we should worry about most. Well, that's a, yeah, very short, but you should be having... Sunspot to me, you know, that somehow you have to explain to me I'm wrong. <laughs> well, one, one of the ideas that you said, I'll, I'll, I'll start the discussion quickly, is you talk about the standard picture of sunspots, yeah. you're right, is, yeah. is that they pop up like mm -hmm. that. But suppose that the field is much weaker, so mm -hmm. it's a bigger tube and it pops up, mm -hmm. right? And the field is too weak mm -hmm. to form sunspots. Yeah, that's one and that possibility. Makes it yeah. and your picture isn't isn't necessarily different um, than the idea that the field mm -hmm. still pops mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. but when it pops up in a flux bundle, mm -hmm. which is which has a much lower flux, yes. then it's too weak mm -hmm. to form sunspots. That's one possibility. Yeah, and, okay. and, and then and then something happens to perturb with the idea that the, mm -hmm. that the field comes from below. Okay. But uh, the popping up is a random on the surface. We don't understand how the flux comes from below and goes yeah. to the surface. That mm -hmm. makes it look random, yeah. yeah. Okay, but uh, sunspot never form in the unipolar region. Well, pairs of sunspots. Yeah, are yeah. Are so sunspot region. pair. Yeah. Right. So but but, but okay. that, that maybe some that solution. Doesn't. I hope so. You know, uh, I hope I'm we'll wrong. More. Yeah. Okay. Why, why does the aurora oval? Increasing size. Oh, that's so okay. This, you know, interplanetary field, as I told you, the interplanetary field combined with the Earth's moon, you know, the, suppose this is southward directly, it's combined. <coughs> so uh, this flux actually is a combined field. So if uh, interplanetary magnetic field southward, is strong, then overexpand. If a weak, it's contract. And if a point north, interplanet field point northward, it really shrinks. So that's, I think, will establish the size of the oval depend on strength of the southward pointed interplanetary magnetic field. So for the largest, what's the furthest extent in latitude that people have been able to see the aurora? Have you been able to see it in, say, Mexico City or some new crazy night? Okay, so uh, the one that I showed you, that's the largest one. 
Yeah, well, it's like then I've chosen the largest one. But usually it doesn't go that far. Of course, sometimes you see the Aurora, the Iowa City, but those are very scattered ones. It's not like what we see in the Arctic region. You were, you were saying today that the Aurora was seen in Hawaii. Yes, uh, 18, you know, Carrington's, famous Carrington's one. But that's perhaps, you know, kind of a strong, and it's, yeah, and it's a red light, that's what we see in Laura, see the Aurora. It's way up high, you know, sometimes more than 1,000 kilometers. So you can see it for a long distance. So it may not be exactly over uh, Hawaii. So that we have no record. So, but um, the curtain like aurora would not go down that far. It's about lowest one is the the Canadian U.S. Canada border. Yes. So you mentioned the Sierra Nevada potentials accelerating yes. particles mm -hmm. and and. Uh, Alpine always used to talk about double layers yes, and, and making yeah. this. And so the mechanism you had was these anti-parallel uh, fields. Another, uh, is there a new mechanism that was in here? Is there some mechanism you were talking okay. about for doing for okay. making these layers? There are two things you do. Okay, what I said, the anti-parallel is the flow on the photosphere. Mm -hmm. the, if you have a field that I can't, the up and down thing, yeah, I want to say then the this potential structure forms where the electron stream come into the ion stream. Okay. So uh, if we throw atoms where the if there is a field that I can't the upper chromosphere so much like upper ionosphere, the number density by the everything, so it could produce potential structure. In the corner yesterday, I had so many talks on that. So, uh, uh, if that happened very likely. And what you say is double layer. The reference double layer is the one idea how this potential structure forms. And uh, yesterday, there was a report that in the potential structure the electron base is very low. And that's what they call double layer. So it's, there are many ideas about how the potential structure forms. But they show double the very low electron base hole. They call it hole. And so they likely that the double layer. And of course it's double layer. I also didn't like the reconnection stuff. I see the question mark on the, like the X on the board. Oh, yeah. The he, he was very adamant that that was always wrong. I, okay. The reason I don't know uh, the connection is uh, I, I do not know what it is. And um, basically, I think now even magnetos take people come to this understanding. Uh, originally, they thought that this can produce the aurora. But magnetic field, I mean, magnetic energy is B square over H pi, right? And, the, you know, and also satellites, there are many satellites. <laughs> now even four or five here, are always round to trying to find this. And the reason we sent four satellite, five satellites is to uh, prove that that produce a hexagonal stream. We never seen it. So uh, I don't think this will do much. The only thing we know that this reconnection produces a stream. And here the, the latest, you know, the idea is that this will produce a stream, and the stream will do something. But uh, we, we're not 
question was that the extreme falsified and the no one can exclude the no theory for the first. There is no continuous flow. And even if this stream comes, it cannot produce the aurora. So, so uh, yesterday I, I said, let's abandon this. And uh, we have enough data here that much closer. It is definitely tenuous radiant. We have uh, various things going on consistent with uh, the production of the aurora. Are there comments from, from uh, neighbor islands? Okay. So let's thank Professor Akasofu again. He'll be here for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not very uh, conformed. And we, we are on the top of the mountain, so beautiful. Uh, <laughs> I just, my mind, mind is gone astray. Sorry for that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what did you say about it?